we'll see. <laughs> Hold that thought until the end of the presentation, and you might might think twice. <laughs> Okay, well, 731, we can get started with these preliminaries. So um, I'm gonna say welcome everyone to the January 2022 evening program of the North Coast chapter of the California Native Plant Society. This is our first official event of the new year. Um, for There might be a few people here who aren't, don't know what the Native Plant Society is, so I'll tell you that the California Native Plant Society is a nonprofit membership organization that brings together science, education, conservation, and horticulture to save native plants. So right now we're participating in the education part of that mission. I'm Carol Ralph, currently president of the North Coast chapter. I'm only one of of many volunteers who keep our chapter active and relevant. Um, our program chair and our Zoom master couldn't be here tonight. So you're gonna be, uh, so I have to be in charge. So if there's things goofing up, it's my fault. Okay, and luckily I have Karen Isa here, who's our salesperson, but she's also good at helping me keep track of things and remember stuff. Okay, I'm gonna give you an early alert right now that uh, a little later on before Leonel talks, we're gonna ask, have you seen any good plants lately? Since we're a plant organization, we wanna know what you've been seeing out there that's fun. So um, if you have some observations, put them in the chat and we'll read them when we get a little farther along. Uh, now the Zoom reminders, this looks like a pretty Zoom savvy audience. Everybody's muted, so you know to stay muted unless you're talking. Now, if you should raise your hand and you get called on, not everybody knows the trick that you can unmute by simply pressing your space bar and holding it down while you talk. It's a, it's a press to talk, just like those uh, Motorola radios. So um, keep that in mind if you get called on and you want to say something. Um, then, yeah, so um, put your questions for Leonel into the chat and we'll deal with them at the end. And, and oh, to raise your hand, if you don't know, you go to the icon at the bottom of your black screen that says reactions. And when you click on that, it gives you some choices of emoji type things and the bottom one says, raise your hand. And that'll put a hand in your, in your black box. Now you don't have to put your video on, but you know, when, when we're just doing uh, the questions at the end or talking at the beginning, the more faces are here, the more it looks like an audience and it's more like talking to real people. So if you wanna uh, be part of that, you can turn on your video. And I think you all learned as you um, signed in that this is being recorded. So uh, you can watch it from a link on our website under the education tab sometime in the future after our Zoom master gets, gets it posted, okay? So I'm gonna test your Zoom skills. Um, I'm going to ask and raise, raise your hand if, if this is something you can, you agree, you have done. How many of you have been to Redwood National and State Parks? So that means to Prairie Creek State Park, Del Norte Redwood State Park, or Jedediah Smith, or any of the uh, federal land that connects all those. So I see a lot of hands. Okay, so I think so. I think Leonel, we have a pretty well traveled audience. Okay, thank you. You can take down your hand, and then um, just out of interest, um, I was curious how many of you are from outside Humboldt County. Um, there was one fellow here. Yeah, so Don Hollander. I know he's. He's in uh, Del Norte County. And who's that? 
Jed Wheeler, did you, I think you rose. Yeah, um, I can't do the raise my hand thing. I'm uh, on my phone. Um, oh, okay. Uh, the, the, the app is a little different on the phone. It's uh, automatically defaulted to a safe driving mode. So I don't have access to the chat or raising hands or any of that, but I'm here, I'm from Mendocino. Okay, well, thanks. I didn't know that the uh, phone version wouldn't give you that option, but okay. And uh, I wait, wait. see, see Car Carol. Yeah, who's that? Reading Gary here. Um, Hi. We're going to get our iPad and switch around um, so that we can do things like that because our phone also. Will. Yeah, it's pretty cumbersome. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't, don't worry about it. There aren't any more questions. Oh, okay. 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 Really okay. Looking forward to this. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay, um, Kristen Alonso, where are you from? And Marjorie Green, are your hands up. Are you from a different place? Yeah, this is Marjorie's husband, Gary, who's sitting in while she's putting her grandson to bed. But uh, yeah, Sonoma County. Sonoma County. Sonoma. Sonoma. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Thank you. So, Leonel, we've got a, a widespread audience, yes. at least as far as Sonoma and Mendocino. Okay. Okay. Uh, next. I'm going to share my screen to show you that. Yes, I would like. You ready? She said we didn't have to. So if you're ready to talk, let me know. Hey, Jane, you need to mute. Oh, I thought Gary did. Sorry. Oh. Thank you. Um, let's okay. see. Okay. You so this is for people who are local. If you want, well, you don't have to be local to want to hear about our programs, obviously. These are things you can do to interact with our chapter. You can be notified of our walks, programs, and other activities. So you can go to our website and click on the join our mailing list. That's the simplest way to do it. If you are local and you want to uh, work in our volunteer nursery and help propagate native plants for our sales, then you contact this email address there. And that is also the place where you can go to buy native plants if you go during the times when we are doing our volunteer work days. And that's Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday, 10 a.m. to 1230, okay? So um, the farm stand where we had plants for sale has uh, moved to a different place. And uh, the land trust is looking for somebody else to, to open this one. But meanwhile, we're selling plants while we're there. And you can always write to this email address about anything in particular you want to buy. Then if you'd like a native plant consultation, that is to get advice about native plants for your yard, or if you want to know what native plants you have, then you contact Melanie at one of these numbers. And just a final note, um, our chapter is looking for somebody to be our secretary, a very important job that, um, is very discreet. It's not one where you have to be wary of taking on too much. It just means coming to our business meetings once a month and producing the minutes. Very important. Okay. And okay. we can always use help with publicity. And when it is bedtime, and it's not bedtime yet. So, so if you want to help with either of those things, um, get in touch with me. Okay. Probably most of you know how to do that. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, uh, I'm going to look for plant observations. Did anybody put some in the chat? Oh, somebody put in there that they're from, yeah, that Jan with an X in her last name is from Shasta County. And Laura says she's in Santa Cruz County, but her daughter lives in Humboldt. Oh, and here's a... A plant observation from Donna Wilder that coast silk tassel male flowers are starting to open. She saw them at Sumeg State Park. Then at Jim and Donna and Clark's yard. Oh, in their yard. Good. I didn't manage to finish that chat properly. Okay, but you explained it. Very good. Yes. Um, the silk tassel were one of the great things we were studying on the uh, field trip in the Samoa Dunes and Wetlands last Saturday, finding males and females. 
uh, Kristen Alonso, Yolo County, I think I said that. And Kelly Runyon is saying hello from San Francisco, hooray. And Carol Monet, another plant observation. Western azaleas blooming in January in the Trinidad Museum Native Plant Garden. Wow, who's confused? I'm impressed. I know uh, the, one of the authors who helped um, publicize the Stagecoach Hill azalea population claimed that he thought you could find azaleas blooming any month of the year there. I, I haven't believed it, but when uh, Carol says it, that in Trinidad, they've got one doing that, I might have to. And Jed says, there's lots of manzanita berries on the bushes in Mendocino. Those must be berries from last year, still hanging on the bushes. Okay. I'll just add that on our field trip Saturday, we, we were paying attention to mosses and leafy liverworts. Um, those those bryophytes. And uh, we all learned a lot by just paying attention to them. And I'm not sure we got the right names stuck on anything, but we got better at looking at them and it was fun. Okay. So um, next on the agenda is uh, Leonel, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say one little thing about Leonel that uh, I haven't seen him for a long time because he's been really busy working up there at, at uh, Redwood National and State Parks. But I did uh, meet him, we figure it was in the 90s when he offered a field trip to CMPS to go up to the one of the prairies along the Bald Hills to see this project he had of planting native grass in the prairie. Well, for some reason, nobody else could come. So I ended up being the field trip and went up with Leonel to see these little grasses that he had planted in a part of that prairie. And I remember doing that with him and it sounded like a really cool project. And I also remember him telling me that um, the fritillary, the common fritillary affinis, uh, which is called mission bells, um, is has edible roots and that when you find a cl cluster of that growing someplace that seems a little bit odd, you should suspect that the Native Americans had planted it there. Well, I have remembered that and I have seen that a number of times and I think of Leonel all the time. So here it is uh, 20 some years later and Leonel is still there working at the park and he's um, now got the title of program manager for Let's see, program manager for resource management and science, which covers an awful lot. And he's going to tell us what that is as he talks about um, the restoration of the Prairie Creek watershed. Okay, Leonel. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Carol. And um, and before I get started with the presentation, actually, I just want to I want to tell you that it's Kamasia Quamash that you were referring to, not not Fritillary. Kamasia quamash, it, and it's a it's a it's a purple plant that grows up um, over by Williams Ridge up in the Bald Hills, and it has a very bulbous root that is tied to to uh, native as a Native American food source. Um, so, or as a food source in general, doesn't have to be Native American. Just a, it's a food source, and and there's one population in the Bald Hills, and it's an odd population because it sits out by itself in the grasslands. Anyway, that's that's the plant, um, but. I'm glad that you uh, remembered our, our soiree back in the early 90s. And um, yeah, it's been a while since I've led a, a walk and it's been even longer since I've done a talk. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen with the title slide and we shall get going. thing over here. All right. Can you guys see the title slide? Yes. All right. Excellent. Um, let me that okay. So happy new year, everyone. And, and uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Leonel Arguello. I am, as Carol said, the natural resource uh, program manager at Redwood National Park for the Division of Resource Management and Science. Um, I've had the privilege of working at Redwood National Park uh, since 1988. Uh, mostly in vegetation management, 
but over the last five years as the Parks Natural Resource Program Manager. Uh, I'm here tonight to talk to you about four restoration projects being implemented or in planning phase uh, in the Prairie Creek watershed and the Redwood Creek estuary. I assume looking at the, the list of folks here, most of you know where the Prairie Creek uh, watershed is, but uh, if you don't, it begins uh, at the junction of Highway 101 and Bald Hills Road, just north of the town of Oric, which is this little town here, which is about 30 miles north of Arcata. <laughs> and it continues through the Prairie Creek State Park for a few miles past the Osagon Trailhead. Uh, for this talk, um, because I've got four projects to cover, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail. My intent really here is to provide an overview um, and purpose and intent about the, these projects. So my plan is for about a 40 minute presentation and I hope there's time for question and answer. Um, so without further ado, let's um, move into the, into the presentation. So what is special about the Prairie Creek watershed? Well, the watershed is a stronghold for listed species such as Chinook salmon, coho salmon, steelhead, and for coastal cutthroat, a species of concern. The old growth redwood forest shown here in dark green offers some of the best high quality nesting habitat for marble merlets. Humboldt Martins, recently listed as federally threatened, has been observed on film from camera traps placed by state park employees um, in the old growth within this watershed. This watershed is a visitor mecca with locals and out of town tourists alike visiting to view elk, wildlife, enjoy a comfortable walk or bike in the old growth redwoods, um, access the coast and the ever popular Fern Canyon, or to go camping at two extremely popular campgrounds. The watershed is 98% in public ownership. And for resource managers, there's opportunity to fully restore the watershed by improving the condition in degraded forests and streams that have fragmented the old growth forest and reduced availability of habitat. Park managers and tribal non-government organizations, private landowners and agency partners have coalesced around a common vision of restoring the watershed from ridgeline to valley bottom. The Prairie Creek watershed is co-managed by both the California State Parks and the National Park Service. And collectively, we refer to ourselves as Redwood National and State Parks. It was in this watershed that the UN designated the park as a World Heritage Site, a testament to the amazing old growth forest you can find here. But this watershed has a longer memory and a relationship with local people who have been living here for many thousands of years. The Yurok people's ancestral homeland fully encompasses all of the Prairie Creek watershed. The work we do in Prairie Creek can really help meet NPS and CSP and California State Park mission statements for restoration. It can service the greater good of helping species recover and it can be celebrated globally as a unique World Heritage Site worthy of protection and preservation. But for the Yurok people, this land is their home, a connection to their ancestors that goes back countless generations. The work to restore these lands is more deeply rooted and meaningful to the Yurok than we more recent land stewards can know. And I'm glad to say that the Yurok tribe is very much involved with every project I'll describe for you tonight. So the project areas I'll be discussing cover three general areas in the watershed. The Redwoods Rising Zone um, are those projects occurring or that have occurred on the slopes and headwaters above the Prairie Creek Channel and or in tributary basins. The main stem of the Prairie Creek Zone are those projects occurring from Little Lost Man, which is um, about in, within the circle here, Little Lost Man down to the Prairie Creek uh, confluence with Redwood Creek, and there are three separate projects occurring in this um, in this section. And the last project I'll touch on is the Redwood Creek estuary itself, which is obviously self-defined. So let's talk about Redwoods Rising. Most of you have enjoyed wonderful walks in the grandeur of this watershed's old growth forest. And if you haven't, you really should. These magnificent forests are ecological treasures and can easily transport you into another time and place. Having old growth forests available for us to recreate in is truly our privilege living here on the North Coast. But sadly in Prairie Creek, as in many other watersheds, you are likely to encounter conditions such as these. Forests and dense dog hair with little to no understory vegetation, trees of uniform size and height, and in this era of climate change, a higher degree of vulnerability to wildfire. 
forests like these in more inland uh, locations uh, are, would be considered fire traps. Left alone, these forests are many, many decades away from developing into more mature um, stand conditions with characteristics closer, more closely resembling old growth. For Redwood National and State Park managers, leaving forests in this type of condition runs counter to the park mission and goals for resource management. In addition to poorly developing forests, with, with the, within the watershed, there are an estimated 160 miles of logging haul roads, triple that number of skid roads, and hundreds of crossings and landings, all in various states of disrepair. With this many roads and crossings, failures are inevitable, and as they occur, deliver sediment into creeks that are already befouled with sediment delivered to creeks from slopes after clear-cut logging. And if culverts are not failing, such as in this picture, there are often barriers to fish passage, preventing fish from accessing spawning beds above them. The removal of these roads and crossings is essential to the overall restoration critically needed in these watersheds and was called out by Congress in legislation expanding Redwood National Park in 1978. Within the watershed, the NPS has already invested a considerable sum of funding to remove to removing roads and thinning forests, primarily in the Lost Man Creek drainage east of Highway 101. In Larry Dam Creek, and Lost Man Creek, about 50 miles of logging roads were removed uh, within this yellow circle from 2000 to 2010. While about 2000 acres of forest were thinned in the south and middle forks of Lost Man Creek in this smaller circle from 2009 to 2016. So park managers really began thinking about the rest of the watershed uh, to the west of, this, uh, this, of these uh, treated areas. And in 2013, uh, began considering restoration in the Lower Prairie Creek watershed, which is the area within the black line of this graphic. In order to carry out restoration in such a large project and in a timely manner, a new model was needed to plan, permit, fundraise, and implement the restoration in this area. And this is where Redwoods Rising stepped in. An alliance between the state and national parks and Save the Redwoods League was formed to tap the strengths and ex expertise of these three organizations to accelerate the pace of restoration, to provide coordinated compliance and permitting processes, and importantly, to raise funds in support of restoration. Two geographies within the National Redwood National State Parks, as shown here in green, were chosen as target locations to implement restoration under the banner of Redwoods Rising. 25,000 acres in the north, in the, in, uh, the Mill Creek watershed, and the, the 9,200 acres of Lower Prairie Creek, which became known as the Greater Prairie Creek Restoration Project. The Redwoods Rising Projects has targeted 9,200 acres of forest to thin, 90 miles of road to remove, and um, at least one mile of the Prairie Creek main stem to improve. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The collaborative was formally established in 2018 and completed compliance and obtained uh, programmatic permitting in 2019. Fundraising, uh, let's see, in, uh, fundraising yielded sufficient funds to start the project in the summer of 2020. The collaborative identified three phases of work in the project area, shown here in green, tan, and yellow. Each of the phase was broken into numbered units, denoting generally the sequence of work to accomplish restoration in each phase. The idea in general was to start higher in the watershed and work down towards the main stem of Prairie Creek, thinning forests and removing roads. But in order to do any restoration in this watershed, managers needed to rebuild the infrastructure in places where road access doesn't currently allow equipment to safely enter project sites. Road reoccupation includes replacing culverts or using temporary bridges to span streams that were no longer crossable and or spot rocking roads where needed to make them drivable. This photo shows a culvert replaced on a main access road within the project area. After forest thinning is completed, roads that are no longer needed are fully removed and restored to pre-road landform. And just in case you were wondering, in the Prairie Creek project area, construction of new roads is not allowed, only reoccupation of existing roads. So with road access reestablished, thinning can occur. The prescriptions used by park staff to thin the forest are designed to leave variability in tree spacing and density across the second growth stand. 
contractors are required to thin um, at variable spacing so that you might have a skip, meaning no thinning, a gap, meaning uh, you know, small openings within the forest, or a thin stand in any one given area. The net effect is to create spatial heterogeneity in the stand, which leads to heterogeneity in understory development and habitat. Staying away from forest uniformity is a goal of Redwoods Rising that is utilized to kickstart development of the stand. As for trees that are felled, they are either left on site in lop, in lop and scatter units, such as what we're looking at in this photo, which is near the Westridge Trail in Prairie Creek State Park, or the bowls of trees are removed to the mill in biomass removal units, such as in this photo. The trees removed are done so using heavy equipment and truck to local mills, mainly in uh, North of Crescent City, in the Brookings area, in Arcata, and in Eureka. The revenue generated from the sale of logs pays for the forest treatment. Or if we have grant funding to pay for the thinning, we use rev the revenue to pay for road removal. Revenue is never used for any other purpose than restoration. And because the trees we are cutting are small diameter, the revenue generated is only partially able to offset the cost of thinning. Equipment used to thin and remove trees from the project site includes some combination of machinery to cut the wood, bring the wood up to a landing and, the process, and process and load the wood onto trucks that are then delivered to a mill. Once forest treatments are completed, roads, crossings, landings, and skid roads, and some of the skid roads, are fully restored to pre-landform condition. The yellow arrows in these photos point to the same alder tree for reference. Heavy equipment such as uh, excavators and dozers and dump trucks are used to implement road removal projects. At road crossings, the equipment operators seek the original creek bed to daylight, excavating all the sediment uh, used to create a crossing. Mulching guidelines established by the park and approved by permitting agencies are then used to guide how we protect the former road corridor from surface erosion. This mulch mostly comes from the trees that were growing on the cut bank or the fill slope of the road being removed, and they are retained nearby until the road is removed. Once implementation, such as in this uh, photo, the after photo is completed, the road corridor is left to recover on its own. For 2020 and 2021, here's where Redwoods Rising projects were implemented. If you were to walk along the West Ridge, the, the West Ridge Trail from the Prairie Creek Campground Visitor Center, you would walk through the Prairie Creek North Lop and Scatter Thinning Unit that was completed very recently. I do encourage you to visit this site and this area when you have the time. Since summer of 2020, the Redwoods Rising Collaborative has thinned approximately uh, 1,200 acres of second growth and removed 11 miles of roads. The roads team has also concurrently daylighted nearly two miles of buried stream channel in the process of removing roads. This is good work for two years of effort completed while we're going this, through this uh, ongoing global pandemic. For 2022, the project envisions removing uh, in Prairie Creek an additional six miles of road and thinning 273 acres of, of second growth forest. Over the next three years, the areas in the blue boxes here will be treated uh, by the collaborative. Eventually work will proceed to phase two areas, mostly south of Davison Road and, and then to phase three areas, primarily in, in the May Creek uh, area. I won't prognosticate on the time it'll take to complete all this work because it's all dependent on continued funding, but we're off to a great start. And I do eagerly look forward to seeing how much work can be completed by 2030. If you're wondering about survey work and, and rare plants, well, all these areas need to be surveyed for rare plants, uh, cultural resources, migratory songbirds during their nesting season. Spotted owl surveys are conducted according to protocols. Um, all old growth areas are presumed occupied by marble murelets. Um, so, you know, we cover all of that ground annually. I, want to, I do want to give my kudos to the Redwoods Rising team uh, from the inspectors to the park and league managers that are planning and implementing these projects. These are complicated actions requiring a high degree of coordination to make it all happen. The team is performing exceedingly well and they deserve high praise for their efforts. Okay, I'm gonna pivot away from Redwoods Rising and move down slope to the main stem of Prairie Creek. There are three projects that I'm going to describe for this section of my talk. All the projects here 
aim to enhance aquatic habitat for fish, particularly listed fish species. All three projects have as part of their implementing action, efforts to restore wood to the Prairie Creek Channel, to enhance native riparian vegetation, and implement actions to control the spread of invasive plants. In one of these projects, plans are underway to reconnect Prairie Creek to its floodplain and create off-channel habitat features as additional refugia for fish. Because Prairie Creek is a stronghold for coho, chinook, and steelhead and is identified in the NOAA recovery plans as a critical watershed and priority for restoration, the actions taken under these uh, three following projects are viewed as a positive step towards the recovery of, of those three species. The first project that area I'll describe is called the Elk Metal Cabins Restoration Project. I'll be brief here as the project is still in its early planning phase. The Elk Metal Cabins is a resort property where um, visitors can rent cabins for overnight accommodations. Prairie Creek runs along the west side of the property and the center line of Prairie Creek forms the boundary with Redwood National Park. The property owners want, want it to help with salmonid recovery and encourage formation of a small group of partners um, that includes the Yurok Tribe, the National Park Service, uh, the, the NOAA Restoration Center, and, and the West Coast Fisheries Program uh, to formulate a plan to improve and enhance aquatic habitat. Prairie Creek along this reach is utterly devoid of large wood, and the channel is constrained on its east bank by a constructed levee. The creek runs along the western side of the valley with little to no meander bends or areas of slack water during high flows. Juvenile fish caught in high flow velocities here will have a very hard time negotiating the fast moving creek. State Coastal Conservancy awarded the, uh, the project funding for design and planning this past fall. Several restoration concepts are being considered under this project. The first is placement of wood structures to provide habitat cover velocity breaks, and to create scour pools to improve fish habitat. Because the owners do not wish this work to obviously negatively impact their operations, the wood structures need to be designed in a way to ensure maintenance of levee stability. Secondly, the project will also propose establishing a, a deeper, more sustainable riparian vegetation zone, as the current riparian, is, uh, riparian stand is narrow and confined to the levees on the creek's east bank and devoid of conifers. Concurrent with native planting would be invasive plant treatments, primarily removal of Himalaya berry. The project may also include creation of, of levy setbacks in a few locations, um, but, but that is still in discussions. And it would allow for Prairie Creek to perhaps expand out into its floodplain in a few spots along this reach of the creek. At this point, the project team has identified 13 potential wood placement sites for design consideration. These features will in some cases utilize existing alders along the banks, either as anchor points or as potential wood sources to be pushed into the creek. In all sites, conifer logs will be imported to create the final structure. Much work still needs to be done before any of these sites is accepted into the final project description. Project partners are looking to implement the project in 2023, so be on the lookout for notification on project scoping and public review sometime in late 2022. Okay, immediately downstream with the Elk Metal Cabin project is the second project I'll discuss along the main stem of Prairie Creek. This project is being implemented under the umbrella of Redwoods Rising, but does not include any thinning or road removal. This effort is solely focused on enhancing aquatic habitat along a mile length um, of main stem Prairie Creek. The project has three components, large wood placement in Prairie Creek, enhancement of riparian cover, and invasive plant treatment. Sound familiar? The large wood placement phase of the project was fully implemented this past September by fishery staff and equipment operators from the York tribe. In the graphic, all the green and orange circles you can see along uh, the creek indicate where wood was installed into the channel. The project is now moving on to three years of riparian tree planting in a 200 foot zone on either side of Prairie Creek and concurrent with the, the, with the riparian vegetation enhancement will be treatment of invasive plants. During installation of wood this past summer, excavator operators opportunistically used their equipment to remove large patches of Himalaya berry growing on the banks of Prairie Creek. Here's a, a short video that I wanted to show. Um, it's sped up, obviously, um, 
it's a two and a half minute video sped up to 40 seconds, but it shows the tribal operator moving wood into place in, in one of the, the, the log sites. The root end of the trees used for this project were always installed first and into the creek to create lots of structural heterogeneity. The trees were stacked on top of each other and often wedged in between existing trees to ensure they are locked in place and don't float away in high flows. The trees used for this project were sourced from concurrent road removal operations being implemented under Redwoods Rising in other locations in the watershed, providing excellent coordination that would have, would have made uh, implementing this project much more difficult had it not been for that coordination. Mostly whole spruce trees grown on road fill prisms were used for this project. The aquatic enhancement team working with the roads team identified and stockpiled trees that were uh, going to be removed as part of road removal but they were, they were set aside and eventually transported to the Davison area for use in this uh, aquatic enhancement project. A total of 26 wood structures of varying size and log number were created in the channel. These photos show the before and after at one of those sites. Once started, placement of all wood structures was completed in four working days and significantly under budget. The Yurok Tribes Fisheries Department and their construction corporation did a tremendous job implementing this project and they are certainly to be commended for their work. And I'd also like to give a special salute to NPS geologist slash hydrologist Vicky Ozaki, who spearheaded this project. She's retiring at the end of this month after nearly four decades of service to the park. She was instrumental in getting this part of the project to completion, and she can certainly step away on a high note to spend some quality time with her new granddaughter. Congratulations, Vicky. Since implementation, we've had just a few rain events. And the photo on the right captures how the large wood can work to create uh, velocity breaks and some cover that fish can hide under and other hab habitat features important for aquatic organisms. For the enhancement of the riparian zone, the planting will stay with a simplified mix of tree species. The goal here is to quickly create shade from an overstory cohort of trees. And then we can consider underplanting with native shrubs to augment habitat and structure. The primary concern in this phase of the project, however, is elk browse, and several tools will be used to help minimize their impact, including using large logs to protect planted seedlings, uh, using deter deterrence sprayed on the seedlings, uh, maybe even uh, uh, small sections of fencing. As mentioned earlier, controlling invasive plants is also part of this project. While control efforts will focus on Himalaya berry, other species might be targeted as well. Reed canary grass, however, is much too ubiquitous in the pasture and open wet areas to be the target of direct removal activities. However, as, we see, as we've seen in many other locations on the North Coast, the successful development of riparian tree shade will naturally reduce uh, reed canary grass cover and dominance. So the final project I'll discuss on the main stem of Prairie Creek is called the Visitor Center and Restoration Project. And although it says Redwood National State Parks, the project really is being directed by and led by the Save the Redwoods League on their own property. It is a two-part project that involves development of a public facility to orient visitors to the park and a restoration, a, a restoration project along the Prairie Creek Channel. For the sake of time, I'll only discuss the restoration portion of the project, but if anybody wants to know more about the visitor development side, I'm happy to provide you with any information about it during the question and answer. This restoration project is occurring on a parcel of land located just north of the town of Orc and at the bottom of Bald Hills Road. The league acquired this property in 2012 and the Prairie Creek Reach runs for about a mile along the western half of the property. Immediately downstream of this property, the creek reaches its confluence with Redwood Creek. As you can surmise from this 2005 photo, the property was used primarily for ranching and hosted a timber mill operation for decades called Mill A. While the league envisions implementing several distinct projects at this site, it is the restoration action being planned on the western side of the property, here drawn in the white and drawn in white on this graphic, that will provide benefit for uh, aquatic resources, restore native vegetation cover, and treat invasive species that will complement the actions being taken further upstream. Once these projects are completed, the League intends to transfer the property to the National Park Service and have it incorporated into Redwood National and State Parks. 
in 2026. So Prairie Creek in this reach can be described as a highly incised channel devoid of any large wood and disconnected, utterly disconnected from its floodplain, particularly in the southern end of the property. Further, the riparian vegetation is confined to a narrow band immediately adjacent to creek and the pasture is full of exotic and invasive species. There are no off-channel habitat features, as you can see from this graphic, no slow water refugia, and yet all the juvenile fish that spawned upstream in Prairie Creek must pass through this stretch of creek on their way down to the estuary. And this feature right here is a, there's a wetland right in this section. And this feature was constructed to help keep that wetland drained um, at a certain level. And that is not uh, off-channel refugia for fish. Restoration uh, looks to engineer a new Prairie Creek channel through the middle of the existing pasture that will primarily reconnect the creek with its floodplain. It will create four off-channel habitat features here, 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 and up in here. <clears throat> and uh, in order to provide fish with places for refuge from high flows and increase food resources. In places where the existing channel is abandoned, it will be backfilled with spoils generated from the construction of the new channel. The amount of fill generated by this project is rather substantial and it would be exceedingly costly to transport offsite. Currently, it is expected that up to 130,000 cubic yards of fill will be generated by the project. Project engineers will use various locations to put the fill material on site, including placement immediately below 101 in the southern part of the pasture over here. <clears throat> and but the bulk of it, about 90,000 cubic yards, will be added to the development zone area of the project site to meet building elevation criteria and other site preparation needs for that project. In the end, project managers are expecting to balance the cut and fill so that none of that has to be transported off site. Once constructed, the newly designed channel will have 25 wood structures placed within this reach to provide added velocity breaks cover, scouring pools, food resources for fish. The addition of these wood structures by itself will triple the availability of wood structures to act as places of refugia that fish currently do not have in the main stem of Prairie Creek, from Redwood Creek to Little Lost Man. It's a wonderful achievement and a benefit and benefit for fish. However, rechanneling the Prairie Creek as described creates a high degree of risk for spread of invasive species that can quickly negate the, the good comes from improving habitat for fish. A couple of the invasive plants of greatest concern is managrass, which creates a floating mat in slack water, and the ever ubiquitous reed canary grass, which can thrive in ponded, slow moving water as well. <clears throat> but, but at the project site, there are other invasive plant species that will need to be addressed and held in check as well. Project managers uh, will rely on a mix of strategies, including high density native planting, mowing, hand pulling and herbicide use to meet the goals for invasive plant treatment. Specifically for, uh, for bamboo, knotweed and Canada thistle, these plants will likely be treated by herbicides initially, then excavated and buried on site during construction. Clearly invasive plant control will be needed for a number of years post-construction to give time for the native vegetation, the revegetation to become established and begin to provide shade and, and cover necessary to reduce invasive plants. The site managers have come up with an excellent planting scheme to replace the pasture and enhance the native riparian zone with 12 different native plant groups. These native plant groupings are assigned discrete planting zones based on elevation above the newly designed creek. The revegetation effort will be mostly, will mostly occur on about 75 acres and the remaining uh, acreage will not be treated or planted. Most of the species assigned to the plant groups are what you would normally find in similar habitats here on the North Coast. There are eight uh, unique planting zones that will host a single or a mix of plant groups. So for example, the largest zone um, that you can see in this table is the upland zone down at the bottom is 33.6 acres and it's a seed mulch mix. The upland transition zone right above it is 17 acres and includes two plant groups, the redwood forest and the salal shrubland. Here's a list of, of species being used for six of the 12 plant groups. The redwood forest group 
uh, plant group, for example, will have salal, evergreen huckleberry, rhododendron, redwood, and hemlock uh, as part of that group. And, and it will be utilized in two locations considered uh, as upland planting zones. In these two locations, the redwood forest group will have nearly 24,000 seedlings um, of various size planted. And so that would be in the east side and over here in the restoration side. Overall, across all project sites, um, the, in planting, planting group, plant groupings and planting zones, the project envisions planting around 172,000 plants, which is the sum of the three boxes that are highlighted in yellow. That's a, a lot of work that is planned to be done out there. But in addition to revegetation, the, the managers will use a strategy, as I mentioned earlier, of intense mulching, fabric, and bark treatments to ensure survival of plant stock and minimization of invasive plants. So for example, in, in this uh, table, the type three treatment areas, cardboard, fabric, bark will be used in mainly riparian planting zones to inhibit reed canary grass from spread. And somewhere between 5,500 and 12,500 plants per acre will be planted in this treatment. In the fall of 2021, the first phase of implementation was completed at the project site. The first off-channel habitat feature was constructed in the northeast pasture, shown here by the yellow arrows. Along with the off-channel feature, approximately 13,000 uh, native plants were planted in, in and around this feature. Uh, work here is not completed yet as the bank separating the main channel with the backwater feature will be lowered to afford Prairie Creek a slightly wider channel as it flows uh, through this area. And so what I'm talking about is both here and on this side. And then of course, next year, they're gonna construct this off-channel habitat feature. So a quick effort at mineral trapping uh, was conducted in, in mid-December in this uh, backwater feature and coho salmon were, were captured. And it is, it, is, it, it is expected that more fish will begin to utilize this and future constructed off-channel habitat uh, sites uh, within this project. The restoration project as a whole will be implemented in phases over the next four years. Um, and more funding is needed to meet all of the proposed uh, actions, but project managers feel pretty confident in their ability to secure necessary funding. And I will note that I will say uh, one further thing about this photo and the, what managers realize is that, of course, elk, again, are out here browsing and pulling up uh, the plants that are being planted. And so the, the project managers are going to be constructing an elk fence to protect uh, the, the zone nearest to off-channel habitat. Um, and they will also be irrigating as necessary for at least a few years to make sure that the, the planted stock um, take root and grow successfully. Okay, I hope this gives you a sense of the restoration occurring along the main stem of Prairie Creek and in the slopes and upper watershed areas of of, of uh, Prairie Creek. All of the projects described have many collaborators working together to get their projects to the implementation stage. And it's a sense, it's with a sense of gratitude as an NPS resource manager myself that these projects and their proponents are trying to bring about real change and improvements in habitat for fish and terrestrial wildlife. I look forward to seeing the good work continuing in this watershed for many more years to come. And so I'd like to make my last pivot and travel downstream through the town of Warwick to the Redwood Creek Estuary for the final part of my presentation. As with the Elk Meadow Cabins project described earlier, there is no final project description that I can discuss with you at this time, but the estuary is such an important link for the survival of fish in, in, uh, in Redwood Creek and in Prairie Creek that it's worth taking a little bit of time to discuss what has happened at the estuary and why there is an active local um, stakeholders group working with the Army Corps of Engineers to find appropriate solutions to restore estuary function while maintaining flood control protections. So the Redwood Creek watershed, including Prairie Creek, drains an area approximately 258 square miles in size. The upper two thirds of the main stem of Redwood Creek is mostly in private hands. The lower third of the watershed is within Redwood National and State Parks. Prior to entering the ocean, Redwood Creek flows through the unincorporated community of Oric. The Redwood Creek estuary is a, a small bar-built estuary located about two miles downstream of Oric. Land in the vicinity of the lower Redwood Creek estuary includes privately owned agricultural lands, a portion of Redwood National Park, 
and a portion of uh, under the jurisdiction of California Lands Commission. The earliest aerial image of Rudder Creek and the estuary was taken uh, June 29th, 1936. The north and middle sloughs, um, as you can see, are, are deep channels that open to a rather large embayment. Um, and the mouth of Redwood Creek has, uh, has breached the barrier, the barrier beach there at a location that currently is where the uh, Kiko Visitor Center exists. The easterly edge of the estuary still appears to be heavily forested. The creek, the valley, and the estuary all experienced significant degree of disturbance since the settlement period, including large flood events, conversion of the original riparian forest that covered this valley to pasture, and clear-cut logging on the slopes above and upstream of this valley. In fact, reports by valley residents in the 40s and 50s suggest that the creek channel in the valley was aggrading with sediment, an expected outcome um, as industrial timber operations took hold in the watershed. Here's a closer look at the historical configuration of the estuary and some key features from a photo taken on June 11, 1941. The estuary in this photo demonstrates a functioning and complex system of interconnected slough channels, tributaries, backwater areas, wetlands, high, high flow scour channels across the floodplains and potential barrier um, beach breaching locations. Boy, that's a tough thing to say. Barrier beach breaching locations. Straight, the Strawberry Creek and the network of floodplain channels around, um, and the network of flood, floodplain channels would serve to concentrate overbank high flows that would direct uh, flood flows across the floodplain and back to Redwood Creek at the head of the middle slough. So that's this area. If, if the flooding occurred, uh, these channels in here would serve to capture that flow and bring it into Redwood Creek again and over the, an overbank flow into the middle slough. Similarly, uh, the configuration in the north slough branches appear um, available to capture and concentrate right, right bank flood flows from Redwood Creek and transport them back to the estuary. However, as more and more residents moved into the valley to work the mills and cut forests on the slopes upstream of the valley, the increasing pressure to protect residents and their private property in the valley came into direct conflict with nature's propensity to unleash large rain events in the winter here on the North Coast. Three times in the 1950s, severe flooding in the valley caused tremendous damage to the town of and Valley of Work. Damage was so extensive and widespread that as part of the federal response to prevent future disasters, Congress in 1962 specifically authorized the construction of a flood control project in the Orc Valley. Then the historic flood of December 1964 hit the North Coast region and it did not spare the Orc Valley. As a consequence, while efforts were ongoing to create a national park in Redwood Creek and the Prairie Creek watersheds, Congress appropriated federal dollars to begin construction of the levees to protect the town of Orc. Construction started in 1966 and the project was completed in 1968, the same year as Redwood National Park came into existence. This photo taken in April of 1968 shows that the levees had been built right up to the final meander bend in the creek. So they're, they're, they stopped right about here. Makes you wonder what might have happened if the core tied off the levees in this manner. Um, the levees configuration, this levee configuration would have preserved the last meander bend in Redwood Creek and maintained the overflow channel into the north and middle sloughs during high flow events. Could this have resulted in the embayment remaining open and flushed of sediment? Would the last meander bend and embayment uh, been able to accept more concentrated upstream flows that because of the levees had no opportunity to spread into the adjacent floodplain? More importantly, would this configuration have prevented sediment deposition in key locations that now threaten adjacent pastures on either side of the estuary? Those questions go unanswered because that is not what the Corps did. The Corps extended the levees directly into Redwood Creek, into the Redwood Creek embayment, and gutted the estuary. Its construction in the embayment caused major physical changes and biological disruptions. As a result, estuary water volume has been reduced by over one half of its pre-levee size due to sediment deposition. Fish habitat and water quality have been severely degraded and Ironically and sadly, the pastures north and south of the estuary are chronically flooded because sediment deposition has impeded water flowing from the hill slopes down into the estuary. 
One of the most significant consequences of the levee extension into the estuary was the loss of physical processes that functioned to flush out marine derived sediments. The levees disconnected Redwood Creek from its floodplain, preventing overbank flows from entering the North Slough or from entering um, the newly created South Slough Channel, preventing the normal hydraulic uh, flow pattern that over the course of the year uh, helps to maintain the estuary sediment budget in balance. You can see in this photo that the North Slough is choked with reed canary grass and the South Slough has a significant sediment plug blocking the channel. The marine deposits at the mouth of Sandcash Creek and in the South Slough Channel that are circled in red are the direct consequence of the levee construction into the estuary and now create flood risk for valley residents on either side of the estuary, contrary to the intent uh, of the Army Corps, the Army Corps intent in constructing these levees. From a biological standpoint, the fish that utilize the estuary for rearing or migration or that have been residents in the past uh, in the embayment area have suffered greatly from levee construction. Restoration of the Redwood Creek estuary would provide substantial benefit for the recovery of the federally threatened coho and Chinook salmon and steelhead, in addition to other estuary dependent species. Recovery plans for salmonids on the North Coast list restoration of the Redwood Creek estuary as their top priority for Chinook, Chinook steelhead and coho. Estuary restoration would be complementary and additive to other large scale restoration efforts in the watershed such as those in Prairie Creek that I've already described for you tonight. But there's still hope to correct and improve the current condition in the estuary. Within the last several years, a local stakeholders group has formed with the intent on working with the Army Corps and the Humboldt County Public Works to find suitable pathways to restore estuary function and protect landowner property from flooding. In fact, the group was convened initially by local landowners themselves who enlisted the help of the nonprofit organization Caltrout to gauge uh, the level of interest in rekindling efforts at uh, finding solutions uh, to the problems at the estuary. Since then, many organizations have joined and the group uh, has created, the group that has created developed a common set of shared values and interest in seeing a restored and functioning estuary. This group, through the county has recently and successfully petitioned the Army Corps of Engineers to engage in a feasibility study under the Corps Continuing Authorities Program or CAP 1135 to investigate whether there are reasonable and feasible alternatives to alter the levees in such a way that it will improve estuary function while maintaining flood control capacity for adjacent pastures. If the feasibility study determines there are reasonable and prudent steps that can be taken, funding would be could be and would be made available to support design and implementation of the project. This CAP 1135 program can provide up to $10 million in funding for a project. At a minimum, the group and the Army Corps will investigate if returning the main stem flow of Redwood Creek into the last meander bend, or the current South Slough, can lead to improved estuary function. A larger embayment, reduced marine and fluvial sediment deposition, improved fish habitat, reduce cover for reed canary grass in the North Slough, all while protecting pastures from flooding. The group looks forward in the next couple of years to finding long-term solutions to the problems created by the well-intended but poorly implemented levee construction in the Redwood Creek Estuary. So that ends my presentation for the evening. As I said in the beginning of this talk, this was a high level overview of projects in the Prairie Creek watershed and the Redwood Creek Estuary. I left a lot of details out for the sake of expediency in a short program. I will say that there are many, many, many smart people that have worked tirelessly on all of these projects, as you might imagine, and they deserve all the kudos and accolades for their dedication and efforts to restoring resources, both in Prairie Creek and at the Red and in attempted to restore them at the Redwood Creek Estuary. So at this point, I'd like to return it back to you, Carol, to see how we're doing for time and to let you know, let all you know that I'm available to um, answer your questions. And if I don't have an answer tonight, um, I will certainly find it out for you. So Carol, back to you. Okay, wow, Leonel. I'm breathless. You must be too. That was a lot of a lot of material. And it's wonderful to hear about all this restoration. It reminds me what my mom said once was that, well, that's the way it works. One one generation messes it up and the next generation fixes it. 
Yeah, but well, we're trying our best, and it's a long process, as you might imagine. These uh, it'll it'll take a lot of years to to. We have a plan in place, and we'll see what um, what we can do. And yeah, it's fun. You know, it's fun uh, pulling all of these things. I work on all these projects separately, um, and it's just really fun to kind of pull it all together and to go through them in a kind of a uh, a, a top to bottom fashion. So. Um, it was fun for me pulling this together and providing this kind of a, a presentation for you. And I think I'm going to do the same presentation for Yvonne Everett. Um, she talked to me uh, and has me uh, doing this presentation in one of her classes at HSU. So look forward to Thanks, that. Thanks, Lionel. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Yvonne. <laughs> so um, okay. are there any questions? Um, you know, uh, I, do, do you want to look through the chats or shall? Um... Um, well, let's see. Let's see. They're, they're mostly uh, thank yous, as I see. Everybody's impressed. I'm going to scroll down. Let's see. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, Vicky's retiring, Jen. Yes, I know. Oh, my God. Um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, Tony has a question. Will there be long, mid long term monitoring conducted to evaluate success and effectiveness of road removal, planting, and resulting vegetation? Absolutely. Part of, um, part of all of these projects have, well, at least the ones that are being implemented now, have um, monitoring uh, as part of, their, uh, part of their implementing actions. So there will be, there's short-term monitoring to meet compliance um, and permitting um, that must be done. And then there's the long-term monitoring to, to look at the change over time and to, to see if we're meeting success. As you might imagine, uh, planting in revegetation, doing a revegetation uh, planting scheme across multiple um, acres takes time to develop. Um, doing the thinning and the resulting uh, understory development takes time to develop. So you've got to have the dedication to do the long-term monitoring. And, and we certainly will be doing that. And I would expect the same for the Elk Meadow Cabins project, which is in planning and the estuary will have a lot of monitoring ongoing for those projects. Well, Thank you, Lena. Yeah, yeah, you're welcome. Don't miss the question from Jen Culp. Oh, did I? Oh, sorry. Uh, she has two. Where yeah. will you get the plants? <laughs> and how will you keep the elk from grazing on them? <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. There you go, Jen. Yes, you had to ask. <laughs> so the first question, um, actually, I will I will um, say that um, the 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 for the Redwoods Rising project, they're going local uh, with a local contractor for getting the plants because there's there's just um, 1,500 plants for that project in that 200 foot zone along Prairie Creek. For the Mill A project, for the uh, for that restoration, that larger restoration at the old Mill A property that the league is is leading, they um, I, I saw Amy Livingston on if she wants to come on and and uh, tell us where she's going to get all those plants or where they're 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 going, but they're going out pretty far to get that many plants. Um, it, and it's a big deal. There's not a lot of, of local, I don't know if all of the 172,000 plants can be uh, acquired here locally. So um, so I, I don't have that answer, but I, if, if Amy is not on the call or not on the, on the, on the, you know, on this call right now, I can certainly get that for you, Jen, and let you know. And then how you will you keep the egg out from grazing them? Good question. Fencing seems to be the best way. And that's what they're going to do at Millet. We're, we're going to try a few things first over at the um, the main uh, over at Davison and, and probably with Elk Metal Cabins. A few things to try and not go the fence route. It's really expensive to build fencing and to maintain it. Um, so we're going to try a few things. Um, wood that might be placed around areas. Um, you know, we're, we're trying different spray deterrents and um, and maybe uh, staking some some rub posts that they can rub without actually getting to the plants themselves. So I, it'll be difficult, and and um, we're going to have to figure that that part out for sure. Yeah, you hire little kids with noisemakers to sit out there all night and day to to uh, scare them away. Yeah, you can have the sprinklers uh, motion activated so when the elk come to browse, they can just turn on and scare the scare the elk. <laughs> um, let's see. Did I miss Here. any other? Griff Griffith is asking, any beaver dam analogs planned? Any interesting beaver considerations? 
Yeah, no, no, no beaver log, no, no, no beaver dam analogs that are considered. The wood structures are not going to be substantial enough to create kind of the uh, the beaver dam analog. Um, so, so no, I think I think mostly so Prairie Creek itself because of its um, the private property interests and the Highway 101 running along the eastern side of the valley really kind of uh, preclude a lot of beaver dam analog development. You don't want to create big ponded water areas. Um, so the, the wood structures are really going to be the key because they will slow down velocity. They will provide um, the cover for fish and they will they can in if they're carefully designed which was is what's going to happen for the elk meadow cabin project can be designed to be deflecting the water towards the western side of the bank which is the park side which is okay with a uh, national park uh, to to have water flow into its floodplain uh and you know where it can we just have to be careful about creating large ponded or large uh, backwater that might impact Highway 101. So that, that's a, a real, and or private property. That's a, that's a, a consideration for all of that work we do on in there. What if, what if real beavers show up? Then they do their business. <laughs> it would be difficult for them to, um, yeah, it would be difficult for them to, to, to really create a dam across, um, across a Prairie Creek, but if they show up, they show up. We'll deal with that. Is there, let's see, am I missing any other questions? Oh, that's, that's great. You know, can I add, this is Tony, can I add two cents about beavers just for a second? Please. While do. you're looking at questions. It's yep. my understanding our coastal beavers on these large um, winter flow rivers are primarily bank dwellers. So I'm not sure, I mean, anybody more wildlife in the group might confirm this, but I think we have kind of a different ecological type of that animal here. I'm not sure if that's, I'm sure analogs would be a great way to uh, create habitat, but we may not have the animals uh, to create analogs of. I don't know, I'm not sure. So, so anyway, if, my two if, cents. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Tony. And if anyone does um, have any any further thought on that, that please do, do, uh, do unmute yourself and let us know. So, I, you know, we will, the wood structures and the off-channel habitat are those features that we really want to use for uh, for improving fish habitat. Those seem to be the the, the easiest work to be done um, that can be done uh, almost immediately. Uh, having having you know large holding back water in the sense of a of an of a beaver dam analog uh, might be problematic, like I was saying earlier. I have a question. Yes, I'm, please. I'm, I'm wondering, um, are you keeping in mind that uh, the sea level rise is going to affect this greatly? Absolutely. Part of the estuary, part of what Army Corps will, will make sure that we consider when it comes to the estuary restoration is, is projected sea level rise. So, um, so part of that, uh, will have to be um, all of the all of the changes uh, and the projections will have to be incorporated into the modeling for what would happen at the estuary if we put the main flow stem the main flow back into the south slough and what would happen to the pastures what would happen to uh, you know to uh, the barrier the barrier beach that uh, is there if if we were to move the the current visitor center inland and upstream. Um, and restore that. We you know all of that will have to be considered as part of the overall uh, project. We we absolutely absolutely. Um, and and so when as part of the feasibility study, which will take probably a couple of years, they'll be looking at that as part of their consideration. The Army Corps with the stakeholders group working on the project. Okay, here we go, Amy. Thank you. Oh, or Amy just sent it to me. So plants for the first phase um, of Mill A, that, that portion of the restoration that I showed you, that, that first, um, that first uh, uh, off-channel habitat feature, were grown at Samara Restoration and, and Johnstein. But uh, for future phases, um, the league still hopes to utilize as many local nurseries as possible. 
Um, maybe seed amplification might come from the J. Herbert Stone nursery, um, you, know, more, you know, more inland environments. So I, I think, Jen, um, I think it's going to be local and maybe regional nurseries are going to have to work on, on uh, providing the, the number of plants that is needed for that project. Thanks, Amy. Um, any other questions? Do you have any um, places you recommend that people go to see some of this? No. Uh, you know, I, I think so. Right now, the the best place to see the the wood structures is Davison Road. So if you go to Davison Road um, off of 101 and walk either upstream or downstream from the elk turnouts um, that are at that pasture. Um, you know, immediately as you come off the highway, there's a couple of turnouts that the parks provide for viewing elk. And if you go there now and walk either along the riparian edge, uh, either north or south, um, I, I would say go north because it's easiest. Um, you'll see all of the, the, uh, the, the places that logs were put into the Prairie Creek. So you can see that work. If you wanna see some of the thinning, um, the best place to go right now um, is the West Ridge Trail. Um, if, you know, the, the places where that are open that you could see some of the lop and scatter work. Some of the places where we've removed biomass um, and the thin is, is, a, is a little, um, a little uh, heavier are still pretty far away from uh, easily accessible sites. So I have nothing other than if you really want to go to an older thinning site, you can go up to Holter Ridge. Um, it is a bike trail and you could walk uh, a mile or two on Holter Ridge or bike a mile or two on Holter Ridge or three, and you, you'll see thinning along Holter Ridge. Uh, but that's older thinning that was completed in 2016. Um, and so, um, but as we move closer to 101 and move eastward in our progress over the next five, the next three to five years, um, you'll all have opportunity to walk trails and see this work up close and personal. And in fact, um, Opposite the Davison pasture, that hill slope to the east of 101, that's all second growth forest up there. That's all gonna be treated in 2024, 2025. So, um, so I guess uh, stay tuned for that. You'll be able to see that up close and personal. That, that's the one on the Berry Glen Trail, right? Correct, that's the one okay. on the Berry Glen Trail. That's, in fact, the whole unit's called Berry Glen. So that will be thinned in 2024, probably 2025 and the roads removed as well. Okay. Well, it doesn't seem like there's a, a too many questions. Um, I do wanna thank you. I do wanna say thank you, Carol, for, um, and, and for Susan for reaching out and asking me to do a presentation. Like I said, it helps me to pull all this together and, and to think about these projects and, and how they're all coordinated. So, um, and, and I thank all of you out there who um, joined in. I, I really appreciate you guys um, coming in and, and listening. And, um, and if you have any questions, um, give me a call um, or send me an email message. Um, put my email message in a, let's see, let me just put it here to everyone. It's my email. Well, we we thank you at Leonel. It really was super interesting, and we'll keep all this in mind as as we uh, see these things happening when we drive north. Yeah, yeah, okay. And if there's any questions that come out of this, um, um, just let me know, Carol, and I'm I'm happy to to do it. Okay, and yeah. we'd like to thank you by offering you one of our T-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm good. I, I, I probably shouldn't take anything um, at, in, of value, uh, given my role as a Oh, as there's a that. Employee. Right. Yeah, okay. That yeah, thing. we're not bribing you. No, no, I know you're not. And, and it's all good. I, I, no, I, I, I just, it's all good. I'm, I'm totally fine with it. Maybe yeah, you can give well, it to, us, to someone else. <laughs> okay, well, we, we'll have them for sale at our next plant sale. All right. First weekend so. of May. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, I guess I hope you have a chance to read all these thank yous.
Yeah, no, I, I am reading them, and, and I and I really thank you all for 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 the for the kind words. And and like I said at the end of my presentation, there are so many incredibly smart people who are working all the angles to make these projects um, a go, and um, both um, both working behind the scenes and right on the ground doing the the work for the, all the survey work, all the inspection work, all the monitoring work, all the implementation work. It's really, it's really quite an effort and of all these four groups and all these uh, all these four projects and all their groups are working together and um and it, it, it's really fun it's a lot of fun to do and um and so i thank you all for your kind comments and, and i and i and i would extend that out to that entire team working on all these projects well i'm sure our audience is thankful to all those groups too and you can pass it on to them that we're all cheering for you guys yeah. And, and I don't know I, how can I don't know why we should be proud, but I think we are that it's happening. Yeah. And well, I want to be sure you don't miss the thank you from Don Hollander, who says thank you, a very informative, clear, and frankly thrilling presentation. Yeah. I love that this is happening. Thanks. Who that was Donald? Don, who 